Chapter 6, Revelations. The knock on my door was so gentle that at first I thought I imagined it. I was lying on my bed staring up at the ceiling, drifting into one of my own childhood memories. Memories that floated by like old time silent movie. The characters and events passing in silence. Silent laughter, silent tears. Mommy and my stepdaddy being playful. Papa George gazing up from his paper and Grandma Arlene standing nearby. A soft loving look on her face. Everyone waving, applauding, arms held out. My stepdaddy lifting me into the air. Papa George standing over me as I practiced my fiddle. The memories became more liquid, rushed by faster. Scenes emerged and faces were swept away. The silent music stopped and there was my stepdaddy's gravestone before me, growing larger and taller until there was nothing else in my vision. The knocking grew louder. Yes, the door opened and Carrie entered sheepishly, carrying a tray with my dinner. Hi, he ventured. Hi. Ma wanted me to bring this up to you. I'm not going to eat anything in this house again, I said. I'm just resting a while, and then I'm leaving. Don't be silly, Melanie, Carrie replied and put the tray on my desk. Where will you go? I don't care. Anywhere but here. I'll find work as a waitress or a scrub woman someplace. Carrie laughed. I mean it. You know I left before and I can leave again, Carrie. Okay, but in the meantime, if you don't eat, you'll only get sick and spite yourself. Go on, I'll keep you company. It's good meatloaf. Mom does a great job on that. I know she does. She told me it's your father's favorite, I said, spitting the words at him. Carrie shrugged. Doesn't make it taste any better or worse. I like it a lot too, and so does May, and so will you, he added. Come on and eat, so I can brag how successful I was. I gazed at the food. I was hungry, and it was stupid to permit Uncle Jacob to make me suffer. I rose from the bed and went to the desk. The aroma of the meatloaf was enticing, and I had to admit, it tasted wonderful and succulent. All the flavors just perfectly mixed. Carrie sat watching me. I think your mother became a wonderful cook just so she would have some place in the house where she could be away from your father much of the time, I said. They were different before Laura died, Carrie revealed. We were all different. We did more things as a family. Dad wasn't so uptight about everything. We went for rides, went to restaurants, took walks on Sunday. During the cranberry harvest, we all went out there working and we would have a big feast and a celebration. Dad even danced with Mom. I don't believe it. Dancing is surely sinful, I said between my mouthfuls. Everything became sinful after Laura's drowning. I told you, he blamed himself. Why was that, Carrie? You've told me that, yes, but I don't understand. If your father lived such a moral life, read the Bible every night and made sure you were all prim and proper, why would he feel responsible for an accident? Carrie shook his head. That's between him and his own conscience, I suppose. I never asked him, he admitted. Maybe you should. If he's going to make everyone else suffer, he should at least explain why, I insisted. If we suffer, we suffer because of our own sins, Carrie claimed. Then he looked away. I knew why. Maybe what you think sin, maybe what you think is a sin isn't, I said softly. It's not a sin to love someone too much. Yes, it is, he said quickly. Remember Adam? Remember original sin? Should I? Did I commit that too? I started to smile. All right, tell me. After Eve ate the fruit and was doomed to be cased from paradise, Adam ate so he would not be without her. That's loving too much, he explained. Just like a man to find another way to blame a woman for his own mistakes, I said. Carrie's eyes widened. What? That's just a Bible story, Carrie. Do you really believe it? He turned away again. 
The Bible's full of lessons that prove true in our own lives, he recited mechanically. I tried to see his rehearsed words to the true heartfelt feelings that lie behind them. There was something more he wasn't telling me. I could feel it in the silence and see the way that he held his jaw tightly. Everyone seems to want to bury his head in the sand in this family, Carrie. It seems to be in the blood, I said dryly. What do you mean? What do I mean? Right from the start, Grandma Olivia and Grandpa Samuel created a little lie who my mother was. My mother continued the lies and so did my stepdaddy Chester. They put Grandma Belinda away so no one would learn the truth, whatever that is, and everyone went along with it, including your parents. Your mother told me lies were like termites eating at the moral foundation. If that were true, you'd all be living in rubble, I said. Carrie didn't argue. He nodded and looked horribly sad and tired. He stared at the floor for a while, and when he finally lifted his head, his eyes were glossy and tearful. I lied too, he said. I didn't make that hole just to watch over Laura when she was seeing Robert Royce. I made it before. I didn't know how many girls and Laura... I didn't know how many girls and Laura was the softest, prettiest person in my life until she started seeing Robert. We did everything. <clears throat> we did everything together. We never hid anything from each other. One day, he continued, she started to lock her door. Everything in her life had became so private and secret. She grew up faster, I suppose, even though we were twins. I felt left out and alone. I never had many friends in school. Laura was starting to make no more friends and be involved in things without me. We were drifting apart. I don't know why I did it, he said. She locked me out and I wanted to spy on her, I suppose, and see what it was that she would do by herself, why she wanted to be alone. He raised his eyes to me again, <clears throat> this time the tears emerging and trickling down his cheeks. I never told anyone this before. And you think that was your sin? I asked softly. It was, he asked. He took a deep breath. I watched her without her knowing. In her most private times, he confessed. My heart was pounding. The silence between the words was loud and revealing, as was the look in his eyes. I thought about the times I would have hated anyone spying about me. He was right. It was a serious violation. I'm sorry for it, he concluded. The morning she left with Robert to go sailing, I was angry at her and was angry at me and she was angry at me, and we never had the chance to make up. She was found out, she had found out that I had been watching her with Robert, he said. The pain in his voice made his heart ache, made my heart ache. How? I said something that only someone who had been spying on her would know. Maybe I wanted her to know, maybe I couldn't keep it inside anymore, the guilt. She never came back, so I could never tell her how sorry I was. That's why I went looking for her as long as I did. There were times during that search, I stood up in my boat and shouted over the water, Laura, I'm sorry, and I shouted till my throat ached. But she was gone, it was too late. She died hating me. I'm sure she didn't really hate you for it, Carrie. She was angry, but you two were too close to hate and have a chance to set, for hate to have any chance to set up any roots. He shrugged, a small smile of gratitude on his lips. I was telling you the truth about the hole upstairs, but I put the sofa over it and wiped it over my memory. I believe you, Carrie. I didn't want you to think I was invading your privacy, too. I smiled at him, and he wiped the tears from his cheek. I believe you, Carrie, I really do. Well, you ate. I guess I can brag, he said. He stood up, his eyes fixed on me, strong, loving, and very caring. Don't run away, Melanie. Ma is angry at Dad for what he said to you, and he's feeling low. 
If you just pretend he never said anything, more burying of the truth, sometimes that's easier, I suppose. Easier, Carrie, but there's always a price to pay when we hold a funeral for honesty, isn't there? Maybe. All I know is I don't want you to leave. I won't leave, I said finally. I still have some unfinished business, like finding out who my real father is, I said dryly. Carrie took the tray. I'll take it down myself, I said. I don't need you to f I don't need your father complaining about me being waited on too. I don't mind waiting on you, Carrie said. Our eyes met again and the memory of our kisses upstairs in the attic workshop rushed it back over me. I felt the flush come up to my face. Yet, for all the warmth that flooded through me, I still felt an eerie chill as I thought of Carrie's odd behavior and feelings for his sister. Thoughts and feelings that were definitely wrong, even sinful. Uncle Jacob would call them. I couldn't help wondering if the feelings Carrie claimed to have for me were really leftover desires he had for Laura. Would I ever be loved or wanted for who I really was? But even as these thoughts flew through my mind, I felt my body respond to Carrie. What was wrong with me that I could feel both repulsed and attracted at the same time? Perhaps Uncle Jacob was right. I was truly a sinful wanton. Maybe there was something flowing through our veins, something lustful, sinful, and evil. After all, I thought I am Haley Logan's daughter. Maybe I would hurt Carrie just the way Mommy hurt so many young men. Men like Kenneth Childs. Carrie took a step toward me, and I moved quickly to seize the tray and step around him. I'll take it down now, I said, avoiding his eyes. I knew if I looked, I would find two dark pools of disappointment. When I reached the bottom of the stairway and turned, I saw Uncle Jacob in his chair listening to the news on the radio. May was sprawled out on the rug at his feet, reading. Of course she didn't hear me. Uncle Jacob's eyes were fixed on me at a moment, and then he shifted away guiltily, I thought. I continued to the kitchen. Aunt Sarah wasn't there, and the dishes were still piled up in the sink. I rinsed mine off and put them in, too. I was going to clean up for her, but I was curious where she was, and I saw that the back door was slightly open, so I went and peered out. There she was, sitting alone on a small bench, her arms folded across her chest, gazing into the darkness. Aunt Sarah? Oh, she said as if she'd been caught doing something illegal or immoral. I stepped out quickly. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to ruin your dinner tonight. She shook her head. Jacob doesn't mean half of what she says, she insisted. I tried to keep the look of disbelief from my face. It was something she had to believe to live in peace, I thought. He always regrets his blustering, she continued. I told him. I explained it. I was just taken by surprise. May is just curious. I know it's natural. You didn't do anything terrible. I should have been the one to start to explain. It's just that's all overwhelming, isn't it? You're going along, growing alongside boys, even playing at the same games, and suddenly you find you're very different. Her laughter trickled off into the darkness. I smiled at the simple but true statement. Then I sat beside her. Did you have a lot of boyfriends before Uncle Jacob and Sarah? Me? No. I never... No, she said. Well, there was someone I had a crush on, she confessed. But every girl had a crush on him. Who was that? Teddy Jackson. He was always so handsome, even when he was only 12. Oh, I said... It didn't surprise me that any woman would see Adam's father as a handsome dreamboat. It was just that my dislike for Adam was so strong and I wasn't happy to hear about it. Aunt Sarah was into her own memories, however, and didn't notice my reaction. Of course, he never gave me a second look. He had all the prettiest girls. I was never much to look at. That's not true, Aunt Sarah. You're very pretty. Oh, I guess when I fix my hair and put on something nice. I don't embarrass Jacob, but I'm no movie star, she said laughing. 
Laura, Laura was the prettiest one. Yes, and so are you. Your mother was always pretty. She had the kind of beauty that caused everyone to stop and take notice. You better not mention her name anywhere near Uncle Jacob, I warned her bitterly. She was silent and she looked into the darkness again. He didn't always feel that way about her, she said. But the way he said it, it sounded as if she were almost jealous. He used to think the sun rose and fell on her smile, just like all the young men, I guess. You never know it, I said. This revelation was making my head spin. It was the first time Aunt Sarah had really talked about the past. Oh, I know it, she replied quickly. She shook her head, I know it. What are you saying, Aunt Sarah? I asked, holding my breath. What? Oh, she laughed. I'm not saying anything. Not anything important, at least. Don't you think anything of anything Jacob bellows? She emphasized, patting me on the hand. He's just uncomfortable around women, and women talk is all. He shouldn't have taken it out on you, and I told him so. She looked away again. Someday, Aunt Sarah, I said, taking her hand and forcing her to turn back to me. Everyone in this family is going to have to start telling the truth. What do you mean, Melanie? I don't know what I mean yet, Aunt Sarah, but I have a feeling you do, and so does Uncle Jacob, and especially Grandma Olivia. She stared, fear in her eyes. Maybe you shouldn't have gone to see Belinda, she said, her voice in a whisper. Maybe she put bad thoughts in your head. Or maybe she pointed to me toward the truth, I replied. Aunt Sarah shook her head sadly. Don't go too far, Melanie, she said in a voice suddenly full of wisdom and firmness, a voice unlike any other she used before. It's what happened to Laura. She turned away to stare into the darkness as if she half expected her lost daughter to come walking up from the beach in the sea in the storm. I left her alone and cleaned up the dinner dishes before going up to bed to ponder her warning. I guess you didn't have such a great weekend, Kenneth said, after glancing at me when I got into his Jeep Monday morning. He put in the gear and drove away before I could respond. He glanced at me again and we turned down the street and headed toward the town. I sat stroking Ulysses, glazing out at, gazing out at the ocean. A number of times during the night I'd waken from sleep, nudged by a troubling image or memory or of harsh words. I would lie there, staring into the darkness, listening to the creaks of the old house and the wind blowing from the sea. Even on the brightest days, there were too many shadows in this home, I thought. The wind sounded more like whispers on the stairs or just outside my door. I wasn't only one struggling with the past. There was a silent war being construct conducted here. A war with no guns, but fierce battles nevertheless, with casualties being truth, happiness, and contentment. Don't want to talk about it? Kenneth finally asked. I visited Grandma Belinda, I said. How'd it go? She said many things, some silly, I suppose, but some that infuriated Grandma Olivia. I bet, he said with a smile. She said Grandpa Samuel liked her more, and she said that your father was one of her boyfriends, and that made Grandma Olivia jealous, I blurted. His smile froze, and then he metamorphosed into a hard and deep expression of pain. That's why she's in a rest home, he mumbled. She looks healthy and she's sweet, gentle, childlike, I continued. He drove his face sullen. I'm sorry about what she said about your father. It doesn't surprise me, he replied. He turned to me with a smirk on his face. I've heard such talk about him before. Dad was always what is referred to as a ladies man, he said sarcastically. He can be very charming, I admitted. Kenneth looked at me. You too? He shook his head. As long as it's in a skirt, he can't resist, no matter what age. Is that why you two don't get along, I said quickly, trying not to offend his callous remark. 
How he conducts himself in his business, not mine, Kenneth replied. Let's not talk about him. It puts me in a bad mood, he said, and then turned to me. Just as you've been told, digging up the past is only going to revive unhappiness. And we have enough to contend with in the present. <clears throat> Besides, he added, you're my special model now. I don't want you coming around with a long, sad look on your face. I want you fresh, lovely, and curious about yourself, not others. <clears throat> Concentrate on our concept when you're with me, he added, and we drew closer to his house and studio. You're the one who asked me about the weekend I shot back. He thought about that, then nodded. You're right. He held up his hand. I'm guilty, which shows you even I can be tempted into the wrong frame of mind. I'll make a pact with you, he said, and he pulled into the driveway. I won't ask you any questions about your private life, and you won't ask me any about mine. We'll be just in the world of art, okay? Art isn't a world separate from the real world, I said, my eyes narrow, my gaze fixed and determined. Ideas, images, colors all come from your experiences, don't they? He stared silently at me. A friendly, almost loving glint came into his eyes before he smiled. You're quite a kid, he said. With so much admiration and pride, I had to blush. Okay, you're right. But we'll do our best, deal? He extended his hand. I stared at it a moment. He wanted me to answer and swear to be silent, to look, to lock up my thoughts and questions, to put aside my quest for the truth. I shook my head. I can't promise something I'm not sure I have the strength or even the willingness to do, I said. He sighed with frustration and then smiled again. All right, but at least promise you'll try. It's important to my work, he waited. I'll try, I offered, weakly. It was enough for now. He hopped out of the Jeep and I followed. He laced us at our heels. I had been working all weekend, he said, when we went around the house to the studio. Even without my star, he added, throwing a smile back at me. When we opened the studio door, I saw what he meant. Near the marble block was a large, mass-shaped wave about to crash on shore. It's not exactly right yet, but it's something like the wave I envisioned, he said. Do you see it opening at the center? Yes. I want you to go behind that wave and crawl under and come out through that hole. Really? That's the idea. I can picture you emerging from a wave, as a part of a wave, this way, understand? Yes, I said, thinking it was a very clever idea. Just crawl in first and I'll tell you how I want you to stand and so on. He went to the drawing table, then he nodded at me and I walked around to the wave. I found where he had left the room to go under and come up through the opening. At first I felt a bit silly, but I did it. Okay, he said, and stepped away from his table. Okay, he nodded, stared, thought, walked about, and then nodded again. Okay, this is going to be a bit tricky, but don't worry. We'll get it right. Go back down and come up very, very slowly. I just want to see the top of your head at first. I did as he asked. Stop, he said when my head was visible. Very slowly now. Yes, slower, slower, stop. Perfect. Is that very uncomfortable for you? Yes, I admitted. He thought a moment and then moved quickly to the cite. He gathered up big cushions and brought them behind the paper wave. Hold that position until I stuff these pillows under you. Okay, you can sit there. He ran around to the front again. That'll work for a while, he said. Come on out and I'll explain to you in more detail. I wriggled out of the wave and took my place beside him. He had already drawn a sketch of the wave but had left the middle undone waiting for me. It's hard to think of a picture, a painting, a sculpture as having movement 
but this is what I have to capture here because the movement is your development, your emergence from the sea into the beautiful young woman. Your body will first appear as liquid flowing and it'll start to emerge separate from the wave. I nodded, although I wasn't sure I really understood. Now, he said, pausing to turn to me, you wouldn't emerge dressed in a sweatshirt or a pair of jeans. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? <clears throat> my pulse began to throb, my heart racing at the thought of what he was alluding to. The idea of standing naked before Kenneth, whether he was my father or not, made me queasy. Yes, I said, almost too, too softly to be heard. I have to have you comfortable, at ease. You've got to get past yourself and me and become part of this work. The essence of the work. Think of yourself as a sculpture, not as Melanie Logan. Undressed in the same barn, okay? I nodded weakly. My shoulders are too bony and my collarbone sticks out too far, I complained. I also have a patch of freckles over here, I said, pointing to my chest below the collarbone. Kenneth smiled. I don't think that's going to be a problem for us, Melanie. You're far from bony. Look, he said more patiently. I know it's unfair to ask you to achieve professionalism attitude the first time you model for someone, and I wouldn't expect perfection right away, but in time you'll see, he said with a warm smile. As hard as it is to believe, I would become very ordinary after a while. He paused and locked the door. You didn't tell anyone about this, did you? He asked quickly. I shook my head. Good. The realization of what he feared made me laugh, especially when I considered how Uncle Jacob reacted to the little I had told May about the woman's body. Suddenly all the fear and nervousness left me as I realized that modeling for Kenneth was just the thing to get Uncle Jacob's goat. What's so funny, he asked, smiling. I told him about May's revelation and first kiss, and then her questions, and how I had explained them, and that I had given her some information about making a baby. And then I told him what happened between Uncle Jacob and May. I can't wait to see Uncle Jacob's face when he sees Neptune's daughter, I said, still, <clears throat> still unable to keep my laughter from my voice. Jacob's a horse's ass, Kenneth said. He always was. He never had many friends, and he always was the object of jokes and ridicule because of his high and mighty moral attitude, as if he were some sort of Old Testament prophet. Haley teased him a lot, too, he added with a small laugh. She did? Will you tell me about it? He sighed. All right, here's the deal. I tell you about the old days, when we break for lunch or rest, if you promise not to ask any questions and not to talk while I work. Deal, he offered. This time I seized his hand so fast it brought real laugh to his lips. Then he grew serious. We'll do this slowly, he said, as slowly as I envision the work itself. Just take off that sweatshirt for now. I want to see you up here in the morning, he said, indicating just above my breast. Your face, your neck, and your shoulders. Take your position, he ordered, with a smile and wave of his hand. I went behind the paper wave and pulled off my sweatshirt. Then I crawled through the opening and sat on the pillows, just my head emerging. He began to work, and as he did, I saw his face become intense and his eyes so riveting, I couldn't keep mine off him. After a while, he said, another pillow? I understood what he meant for me to put another sofa pillow under myself so I would come up a bit more. When my head was high enough, he indicated that he wanted to continue to work on and on. This is just the shape, the outline, he explained. We're gonna have to spend a lot of time discussing the expression on your face and how I want you to look, your eyes, your mouth. The best way to do it is to get you to think of something in your own past that will fit. Some events, some moments, some thoughts, experiences, just as I told you, art is a world by itself. I quickly quipped smugly. He paused and smiled. All right, don't be a smart ass, he said, and we both laughed. Maybe I would be able to do this. Maybe I would be able to relax with him and create his greatest work, I thought. Break, he called after nearly an hour. He brought me a large bath towel to drape over my shoulders and put, some, and put on some water for tea. The towel covered my shoulders and brow. 
I used it to wipe the perspiration from my face and neck. It really is work just standing still, I said. He nodded. I'd rather be on the side of the brush. On this side of the brush, he admitted. You take sugar, right? Just one teaspoon, thank you. You know, what you were telling me about May and her questions is exactly the sort of thing I'm after here, he said. He sat at the small table and I sat at the stool beside him. She's emerging out of childhood into the first stages of womanhood. Can you recall when this first happened to you? Yes, I guess so. What was it like? Scary and wonderful, I said. He nodded, obviously encouraging me to continue. I thought about it. There were new feelings in old places, he smiled. Yes, he said, exactly. When May told me about her first kiss, I thought about mine and how I had to run all the way home and gone into my bedroom to be alone with my excitement. I wrote the boy's name about two million times and dreamed about more kisses, longer kisses. Did you tell your mother about it? After a while. And he asked, very interested in what she, she had said. She laughed and told me not to believe in kisses or any promises made while kissing. She said, make them pay and they're never too young to pay. I didn't understand at the time. I said, wanting to see what would offer as an explanation for Mama's bitter attitude about men. She ruined the moment with that kind of talk. You have to believe in magic at first. Haley didn't stop for magic. That was her problem, he said. I don't think she enjoyed growing up or gave herself enough time for innocence, understand? Sort of. You mean she grew up too fast? Worse. She gave, her, she gave herself away too young, he said. My breath caught. How do you know that? She told me, he said. And I understood it, had, it hadn't been with him. But let's go back to you. When you're coming up out of the wave, you're just feeling these new sensations and you're full of some sort of questions. May had about herself, questions you had too, understand? Think of that and concentrate on it. He paused and glanced at me. Your body is developing. There are tingles, feelings, sensations in places you never were before. You're standing not the neatest most organized individual you've met. You're standing in front of the mirror, naked, and you're getting, and you're seeing things that you said surprise, frighten, and thrill you at the same time, okay? I nodded. The air was so warm around me. I did feel as if I'd slipped back in time. His words worked magic. My body remembered itself. The first tingles returned the images. The tea kettle whistled, breaking my reverie. He poured us each a cup and offered me a cracker. How do you know so much about women, I asked, and he laughed. Me? I'm far from an expert on women. You're confusing me with dear old dad. Is that really why you and him don't get along well? That's part of it, he said, taking a sip of tea. Per parents shouldn't try to force their children to follow in their footsteps. Especially if their feet are made of clay, he said. He talked a little about how his father pressured him to go to law school and how he rebelled. I told him about Carrie and his dream to leave the fishing business and become a shipbuilder for custom boats. I told him to tell his father. Did he do it, he asked, his eyebrows raised in anticipation. Yes, and his father threw a fit telling him that his family tradition and a fisherman and cranberry farmer was what he had to be. Horse's ass, Kenneth said. Carrie will do it someday, I said firmly. Kenneth stared at me with a softness in his eyes. You like him a lot, don't you? Yes, I admitted. Romantically? I nodded, sensing Kenneth wouldn't judge me for my relationship with Carrie. Not your first boyfriend, though, is he? He asked. He sounded more like my father now, a father who hadn't seen his daughter growing up. But, no, but he's the most... Serious. I nodded again, and I sipped my tea. Don't give your heart away too quickly, Melanie. 
It's the most precious gift you can give any man, he advised. I won't be like my mother, if that's what you mean, I said sharply. He smiled. Good, he said. That's good. We returned to work, and Kenneth put more detail in his drawing. He explained what he intended to do a half a dozen of those pictures, each taking a metamorphosis into another stage, so it would be like doing an animation. He flipped the pictures quickly so I would get an illusion of the movement. After lunch, he showed me how to use some of the carving tools to do the preliminary work on the block. Even though it was hard work, I enjoyed it. Enjoyed knowing I really was contributing to this artistic masterpiece. The day flew by and I didn't have much time to tend to my usual chores, but when Kenneth announced it was time to stop, I actually was disappointed. It's all right, he told me when I complained about not being able to clean and organize his house especially after the weekend. Mondays are always the hardest because he seemed to get even sloppier on Saturdays and Sundays. This is what an artist's life is like. Now you can understand and appreciate why I'm not the neatest, most organized individual you've met. Anyway, he added, you can do what you can here for 20 minutes or so. We're finished for today. I'm going to go down to the beach for a while to think, and then I'll come back and take you home, he said. He left with Ulysses at his heels, and I went to work cleaning and organizing the studio. I swept up the dust chips from the marble block, cleaned and arranged the tools, and I fixed the sofa again. As I was moving about, I paused at the drawing of the desk. I hadn't looked at the pictures yet. Kenneth hadn't offered, and I was afraid to ask. Now they were covered with a white sheet, and I wondered if Kenneth was the type who hated anyone to look at his work in progress. I hesitated. I couldn't help feeling that we'd grown closer because of this project, and I hated to do anything that might threaten our relationship. Little betrayals, indiscretions, and lies eventually tore down the foundations of, of love and friendship, I thought. I had enough evidence of that, and now, because of how things were going between us, I regretted permitting Carrie to take the lock off Kenneth's storage room so we could invade his private and secret cache of paintings, even if they were paintings of my mother, and stirred more mystery. I continued to clean and organize the studio, but my attention kept returning to the drawing table. What harm would one peek do, I thought. Surely if Kenneth really didn't want me to look, he would have said something. I listened for him and heard nothing, and returned to the drawing table. Slowly I lifted the sheet and gazed at the first drawing. There was far more detail in my face than I anticipated. This was more than a sketch, but the face I saw on the paper looked more like my mother's face than it did mine. At least I thought it did, and that's what caused me to drop the sheet quickly, and I heard Kenneth's footsteps. He entered just as I moved away. His eyes shifted from the table to me and then back to the table. Well, he said, crossing the studio, you've got this place looking proper again. Makes me feel guilty every time I mess it up, he said with a smile. He paused at the table and lifted the sheet. What do you think? He asked, gazing at the picture. What? I'm sure you snuck a peek, Melanie. I would have. Oh, I, yes, I did. I was surprised how much detail you got into it already, I said, trying to keep the disappointment out of my voice. Uh-huh, that sounds diplomatic. I'm not an art critic. Not yet, at least, I said. But it looks like the beginning of something special. If only it was my face that would grace the masterpiece, I thought. Yes, it's only a figment of my imagination now, but soon it will grow. You know this is going to take us all summer, he said. I'm not going anywhere, I replied. I was going to run away yesterday, but then I thought, where would I run to? He stared at me, and I held my breath, hoping he would offer his home and sanctuary should I need it. But he remained silent. If the words were on his tongue, he swallowed them. I guess the bottom line is none of us can really run away. We can escape, but we can't run away, he said. How can we escape if we don't run away, I asked. You find another place to go inside yourself, he said, staring at the block of marble, as you found with your art. 
He nodded. What are you escaping from, I asked, and waited as he hesitated, his eyes still on the block of marble. Myself, he said. Yourself. Who I found out I was, he said. He shook his head. Give me time, Melanie. Give me time and a way to tell you what you want to know. My heart skipped a beat. The rebirth Kenneth was creating out of the block of marble might truly be my own.